Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Chris Murphy, and I am the uh, one of the senior admissions tutors in the Department of Physics at the University of York. And I, my great pleasure to be able to welcome you to this, which is the fourth webinar of our winter webinar series. Before we get started tonight, there's a few technical things to cover. Firstly, if you're watching live, feel free to ask questions. You can do this by using the Q&A button, probably either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what format you're using and what kind of device you're watching on. Uh, that's available throughout the event, so feel free to ask questions at any point during the event from now onwards, and we'll try and get to those at some point during, the, during this evening. If there's any technical problems that you have, such as loss of Wi-Fi, loss of connection, anything else like that, you can always rejoin the event using the original link that you've got with your ticket. Remember that today's event is being recorded. That means that you can watch again. Uh, the, there are subtitles available. Um, you can turn those on or off using the CC Live transcript button. Again, probably at the bottom of the screen, you might find it under, under three dots for, for the more section in that, in that link as well in Zoom. The idea of this series is to introduce you to some of the cutting edge research from the University of York uh, in, uh, in the Department of Physics to scientists of all ages, you and everyone else who's joined you on this call. Um, the idea is to give an insight about what exciting developments are happening at York. Um, so hopefully you'll get a bit of an insight into not just a, sort of a stereotypical picture of what physicists do, but a little bit more about the kind of things that we do um, when we're here. So um, they take place on the second Wednesday of each month, uh, and this is the fourth out of five. So just one more to go. The last one is going to be next month. It will be Professor Marco Luca Marini, who will be talking about applications of quantum mechanics into new uh, devices, such as new cutting edge phones and using quantum information, quantum technologies in order to develop new consumer products. Um, all of these topics, all the ones that we've covered already from, from novel materials, fusion energy, and uh, are all part, are all linked in at least to the Physics MOOC, this online course that we offer through Future Learn, which will allow you to find out a bit more about the topics and sort of learn for yourself about some of these exciting physics ideas that will be being covered. A link for that course is now available in the chat. So you can, you can click on that and it will be in the, the description of the video uh, below the, the video in YouTube if you're watching this um, as the record. And now, all it leaves for me to do is to introduce our chair, our chair uh, who will introduce the speaker and look after the, the session this evening, including all the Q&As that you might have at the end of this event. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Josie Ross, who is going to be our chair for this evening's webinar. And uh, I'll pass over to you, Josie. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, good evening, everyone. And this evening, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Mikhail Bashkanov to the webinar series. So Mikhail graduated in Moscow, got his PhD at Tübingen University in Germany, where he worked for many years before being awarded a Rutherford Fellowship uh, in Edinburgh. And then he moved to York. His main research area is particle and nuclear physics with experiments involving accelerators with various beams. His main field of expertise is exotic particles and the major experiments he's working on right now are in Germany and the US, both involving photon electron beams. And his work has also led to some research in medical physics. Tonight, Mikhail will be talking about the fundament, fundamental, cons, fundamental constituents of matter, and in particular, the strange particles that only exist for less than a billionth of a second. It's going to describe a new facility proposed to produce strange particles and what we can learn from these experiments. So on that note, I will hand over to Mikhail. All right, thank you very much for a very nice introduction. So good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, let's start our lecture. I hope it will be very interesting for you. So the main reason why we discuss uh, this strange matter and uh, other exotic things right now are, are neutron stars. So neutron stars are very interesting objects. Uh, we learned a lot about them in uh, recent years and uh, some of these studies I want to share with you. So there, we will start from neutron stars. So what are neutron stars? 
what are the constituent of neutron stars, and then we continue to uh, strange particles because that's one of the main problem uh, for us as physicists. We want to know why do we see neutron stars that heavy as uh, 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 from the other side we are not expecting them to see them. Uh, that are due to formation of strange particles. So we will look up uh, how these things are working. And finally, we want to uh, see the major experiments which we are planning to perform in the next uh, couple of years to figure out a lot more about physics of neutron stars, physics of strange matter, can it exist, can it exist, and so on. So let's start from uh, neutron stars. So neutron stars are actually corpses of stars. So we may have a star which lives for quite a while, then it burns out of all of its fuel, explode as a supernova explosion, and then in the very end, we have a neutron star, which is a very compact object. So the typical size of neutron stars is about 10, 12 kilometer radius. So that is only slightly larger than our, our York. But the mass of this object is uh, fairly large. It's uh, between one and two solar masses. Uh, there is no fuel, so the, the star does not burn, and it's uh, fairly cold, but it is rotating. And uh, by making rotation, it uh, creates uh, enormous magnetic fields which uh, can be observed uh, by uh, secondary effects. So neutrons, uh, there are many observations uh, uh, on neutron stars, uh, and it is uh, appeared to be very simple to measure a mass of neutron stars. Because if you have neutron star and another star orbiting around, then uh, by measuring their orbits, or, or you can easily determine what is the mass of neutron star. And uh, on the right side of the slide, you see several observations from various methods. Most of them are binaries, uh, different kind of binaries. What could be the mass of neutron stars? And uh, you can see that most of these points lies we are around one and a half solar mass. So that is the typical neutron star mass. So between one and uh, two solar masses. The most heaviest neutron stars, which we know right now, lies around two, 2.1 solar masses. And we believe that it cannot be more heavy than 2.2 uh, solar masses roughly. Everything which is heavier is uh, probably a black hole and not a neutron star. Uh, so determination of mass of neutron star is fairly straightforward. It's challenging, but uh, it is doable. The determination of radius of a neutron star is a lot more challenging. Now, uh, imagine an object which has a radius of only 12 kilometers, which is placed millions and millions of kilometers away from Earth. Uh, what would be the method to determine their a radius of such an object. Consider that you want to determine the thickness of a hair of an astronaut who is flying on top of your house uh, 300 kilometers above. This task would be a lot simpler compared to measurement of the radius of neutron stars. Nevertheless, uh, we had several measurements uh, right now from uh, from a device called NICER, which you can see here. It was recently attached to a space station. And uh, from there, it, were, it performed several measurements. Uh, there are also other observations, but uh, this one is uh, the top device, which help us to measure the radius of neutron star. And from this, we know that the radius of neutron stars should be around uh, 12 or 13 kilometers. So how do we measure it? So remember that neutron stars are very fast rotating objects. And let's say at some point of time, you have a hot spot, a bright hot spot on the surface of neutron star. It can appear for different reasons. 
Now, if the star is rotating, then some of the time you see the hotspot because you are looking on neutron star, and that some of the time the hotspot will be at the other side. That's why you will see a brightness variation. And this brightness variation can be translated into a radius of neutron star. If you observe different hotspots at different time, you can accumulate this data, and finally you can extract what is the radius of neutron star. Very interesting method and uh, a very funny way how to measure tiny, tiny thing which is located far away from you. So in recent uh, years, we got, uh, they, they got a lot of information about it. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the good way how to measure the size of neutron star precisely. But that is not the only way. Another very interesting method is uh, using uh, gravitational waves. So you uh, might hear uh, in uh, recent years, there were, there were major breakthrough from gravitational wave observatories the one called LIGO, another called v VIGO. They are combined as their, their one set of detectors. And uh, these kind of things also can help us to determine neutron uh, star uh, mass and radius. And also it helps to determine us what is inside neutron stars. I just put here an example of a paper, a very famous paper, uh, when uh, there were people observed a gravitational wave signal from two neutron stars merging together uh, in their spiral and finally merging together. So how does it happen? If we have uh, two objects which are spiraling around, for example, two neutron stars, they will produce a gravitational wave signal. Uh, since they lose energy by emitting gravitational waves, they are coming closer and closer to each other. And that's why their spiraling period changes, become shorter and shorter until they merging into one object and finally collapse, either forming a bigger neutron star or making a black hole. The black hole is their most likely uh, event uh, of uh, this collapse. But we are interested in this uh, spiraling region. Because if you have an object which is fairly sizable, uh, 10, 12 kilometer radius, and it's orbiting around another object of this stuff, uh, both of these neutron stars are squeezed and stretched during this process, and by squeezing and stretching them, we can find out what is inside the neutron stars. If it's some stiff matter, then we would not expect too much of squeezing of neutron stars. If the matter is soft, then it should behave uh, like a gummy. And uh, that's exactly what we are trying to reconstruct right now using these gravitational wave observables. Right now, there were, all of these laboratories are on upgrade uh, and they will start new type of measurement uh, in uh, uh, December this year. So right now we have two devices in the uh, States and uh, one device in uh, Italy. And using these uh, free telescope, gravitational wave telescopes, we can triangulate position of uh, neutron star mergers, which can help us then also to see it. These are normal telescopes. Uh, so far, we observed one and a half event. I, I would say so one is, uh, one is very uh, good event. And the number one, people are still debating, was it the two neutron star mergers or was it neutron star merged with another uh, uh, black hole or was it something else? But at least about one event, we are very confident. We also saw this event in telescope. It happened on our 17th of August, uh, 2017. And uh, that's uh, there, in, uh, they get a lot of information combined with their other observations. Soon, uh, in this new, new 
uh, period, also in our laboratory in Japan, we'll learn to uh, start observation. So that will give us a lot of better accuracy to determine position of mergers and uh, also will improve our resolution and uh, distances to merge events. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> out of these uh, uh, mer merging parameters, we can uh, determine several things. And the most important for us is uh, mass and radius relation for neutron stars. So if you plot uh, mass to radius relation, so here it's shown the radius of neutron star, there's a mass of neutron star. So from mass observation, we know that the heaviest neutron stars can be around 2.1. These are these few lines from the heaviest neutron star we observed so far. And then from gravitational wave observation, from the spiraling, we also know that uh, the radius for 1.4 neutron stars should be in this range between 11 and 13.6 kilometers. And their generally ma mass and radius of neutron stars should lie in this range. So gravitational wave, despite that we measured only one event, so far we know already that uh, the mass of neutron star should not be larger than about uh, uh, 2 point, uh, 15, 2.2 uh, solar masses. Now, what do we want to learn? What do we really want to learn is equation of state. So equation of state, you may remember from uh, your school tasks that equation of state uh, describe their relation between pressure and density. So you press some, uh, press some object and see how it behaves under pressure. Uh, the same is happening with neutron stars. So we want to understand how matter inside neutron star behaves deep inside the neutron star. So is it stiff? So if you press, it pushed back, or if it just compresses, if you would press. If you would add some matter to a neutron star, uh, how this neutron star would behave? Will it, be, it become smaller or will it become larger? And on the picture here, you can see uh, again mass versus radius for neutron star prediction with different models. And you can find out that different models predict very different behavior. And uh, right now, out of these many models, we actually can take only very few one. And what is interesting that neutron stars, regardless of their mass, have more or less the same radius. If it's one solar mass neutron star, two solar mass neutron star, well, all of them will have very, very similar radius. And which is very uh, like unusual compared to many other stars, normal stars. Now, uh, the main thing which we need to learn is what is deep inside neutron stars. And unfortunately, we cannot say as and our astronauts to make some digging and find out what is uh, 10 kilometers uh, below the surface of neutron star. That is not possible, so we need to measure it in uh, some funny way uh, based on uh, the uh, squeezing due to, uh, during gravitational wave observables or something else. And we have several ideas what could be inside. It can be just normal neutrons and protons. It can be various other particles. And uh, that's what we are currently studying, how uh, different particles can emerge under high pressure deep inside neutron stars. So what are the matter around us? So right there around us, if we take everything, we have molecules. Molecules are made out of atoms. Uh, atoms are essentially the clouds of electrons with tiny, tiny nucleus are uh, deep inside it. So the size of the nucleus is uh, very small, and uh, that means essentially all the matter around us is empty. If you look up on nucleus, nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. And if we will magnify our glass even further, we will see that protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. At the uh, pressures of neutron stars, uh, molecules cannot survive and they dissolve. 
uh, nuclei cannot survive deep inside and they also dissolve. Protons and neutrons can survive, but they're only by a little bit. If you will in would increase pressure inside neutron star by factor of two, three, then protons and neutrons will also dissolve and go into a homogeneous matter of quarks. But before it happened, so in real neutron stars, protons and neutrons are stiff enough to survive these harsh conditions. And uh, that's why majority of the matter inside neutron stars is still made out of neutrons with some admixture of protons. So we have several different particles which we can consider we can uh, use in our hypothetical neutron star. So on this slide, you see here standard model particles. So whatever we have uh, right now is uh, placed in this picture. So we have six quarks and five of them we can use to build any kind of particles, like in case of protons and neutrons, we use only two light quarks, but we also can use some other quarks and the next uh, heaviest quark is strange quark. So that's why one consider particles with strange quarks also to be uh, produced inside neutron stars and uh, to live there. We have uh, several uh, particles here which corresponds to forces like photon, which carries electromagnetic force, uh, Z and W boson carries weak force, gluon carries strong force, and some, uh, some other particles. But for us, the main uh, thing is are quarks, because quarks are responsible for their main mass of an object, including us. Now, uh, there are very interesting things. Uh, if we want to quantify different kinds of particles, uh, this uh, property called spin. If you would imagine a particle as a sphere, you can think that it can have a rotation. And uh, then the frequency of this rotation can be either integer or semi-integer. Uh, and to we differentiate these kind of particles. So the, the particles with uh, semi-integer spin we call fermions, and the particles with integer spin called bosons. Uh, particles with semi-integer spin, fermions, cannot occupy the same place. And that's one of the reasons why we cannot go through the wall. So if we approach the wall and start to press our hand against it, then electrons. We are who are fermions, protons and neutrons say, no, no, please, no. We have already everything filled here, so no place for you. While bosons, which are particles with their integer spin, they prefer to occupy the same place. And that's, for example, one of the reasons why we have such things like lasers or Bose-Einstein condensates, which we start to use everywhere right now. Now, most of the particles inside uh, neutron stars are fermions, and that's the reason why gravity uh, doesn't collapse neutron stars into a black hole, because protons and neutrons from inside neutron stars prevent it from doing it, due to power partially due to power exclusion principle. Let's say we have uh, two neutrons, one has spin up, let's say rotating clockwise, and I will have spin looking down, rotating counterclockwise. And uh, that's uh, all the protons and neutrons which fill this level. So we cannot place any particle uh, anymore, any neutron there, because all the space is filled. To place another part or a neutron, we should occupy higher level and higher level. And at some moment, we, are there, we feel so many levels that it appears to be more convenient to change some of the neutrons into protons and feel protons, uh, proton levels. Protons are different particle compared to neutron. That's why power exclusion principle doesn't work on them. So uh, now we can start to feel proton levels. Uh, protons here uh, repel each other due to 
or, or electromagnetic interaction, and that's why the energy levels of protons are slightly higher. But there, at some level, we can fill up both neutrons and proton level, and still our energy gets higher and higher. So what can we do next? We can make another particle out of protons or neutrons, and this particle will be hyperons. Hyperons are particle, particles where we take one of the quarks, either U quark or D quark in proton or neutron, and substitute it by strange quark. Strange quark is uh, heavier, like 30% heavier than uh, uh, light quarks, and that's why these particles uh, uh, does not appear immediately, so that you need to have high pressure to compensate this energy mismatch. In normal condition, we can produce a lot of hyperons, but we leave uh, a fraction of a second, so less than billions of a second, but inside neutron stars, Due to this high pressure from different directions, uh, we can have uh, hyperons produced as well. Uh, now we can try to calculate. So, okay, we know hyperons, we know their masses from our particle accelerators. They know many of them, so we can calculate what should uh, happen with uh, neutron stars if we will allow it to produce hyperons deep inside under some pressure. And on this picture, you see a comparison. So uh, first, let's assume that we don't have any hyperons. Then we will have an equation of state, which describes mass relation compared to radii as this uh, green curve. So we can produce neutron stars as uh, heavy as 2.4 you know, solar masses. Now, if we allow hyperons to be produced here, and immediately we get restricted there that our neutron stars cannot be heavier than uh, 0.7 solar mass. You start to press. Particles or neutrons and protons immediately start to convert into neutron stars. The object shrinks, go into a black hole, and you have, have collapse. How it can be over, overcome? We can, we can find out that actually hyperons are sometimes repel protons and neutrons. And if we take into account this extra rep repulsion, then we can produce neutron star with a mass of about uh, 1.4 solar mass, but not, more, uh, not much more of it. So to understand the appearance of solar of neutron stars with two or even higher uh, solar masses, we need to understand how hyperons interact between each other and how do they interact with uh, neural matter in more details. And for this, uh, we, we will start uh, several new experiments, which I will come up with later. Also, it has a, a very strong connection with early universe. So at early universe, uh, at very beginning, shortly after Big Bang, we had a big soup of quarks. As the temperature dropped down, uh, the heaviest quarks start to disappear. So first, the top quark, the most heaviest disappeared, then uh, bottom quark disappeared, charmed, and so on. So at a time, then quark, quark soup combined into different particles, we had equal amount of up quark, down quark, and strange quarks. So actually, one third of the universe was strange, so more or less universe was full of hyperons, and uh, the way it's cooled down at later stages is fully determined by the physics of hyperons. So that's why, that's another reason why we want to investigate hyperon interactions in more details. Now, how do we do it? And uh, that is not very simple. Uh, we plan to make an experiment at our Jefferson Laboratory. It's located in our United States, Virginia, and it uses our 12 GeV electron accelerator. 
we can very easily accelerate ten electrons via stable particles. There is no problem to interact with them. So you take an electron, you put it in this uh, kind of horse ring, move it several times, accelerate to a fairly large energy, and uh, send uh, to a hole. So what happens next? Next, we want to transfer this electron beam into a photon beam. Typically, we use very thin foil, a few microns. Electrons decelerate in this foil and uh, shine a photon. That's how photon beams are produced. However, uh, in the usual experiment, the intensity of photon, these photon beams are very small. And here we need to have very high photon intensity to produce a lot of hyperons later on. That's why we increase the thickness of this foil from few microns to two and a half centimeters. And uh, now imagine you place huge electron beam on uh, something which is by weight about uh, one pound coin. And then all of the beam is more or less stopped or decelerate quite a lot in this uh, target. It is copper target, so two and a half centimeters long, uh, a few millimeters in diameter, and uh, you release 60 kilowatt of heat in this small piece of copper. You can blow it up in a second, so that's like uh, 60 kettles for just a uh, thing with the size of not much larger than a, a one pound coin. Another interesting thing that uh, in addition to producing uh, photons, these electrons knocking out uh, protons and neutrons out of the target and create enormous radiations. So all you need in principle is a tiny, tiny target, uh, but uh, in reality, you need to put a lot of cooling to, to just prevent it from, from evaporation. And you need to surround it by enormous material to uh, let people work in uh, fairly distant regions. And all in all, you need about 100 tons of shielding. And most of these 100 tons of shielding is, a, is tungsten and a little bit of lead. So lead is melting too, too fast. So that's why tungsten is a lot better. It's also more dense. It, is a bright, it will be a brightest uh, man-made source, then we will build it in uh, three years roughly from now. Now, let's say we produce photons. So what do we do next with them? So we heat them to another target. So this time it's not a copper, but the rhenium. And in this case, we can produce a strange particle. And uh, in particular, we are interested in their uh, long-lived chaos. Long-lived, uh, that's uh, by particle physics point of view long, uh, the, the life of these cans is about 50 nanoseconds. Uh, so if you fly with a speed of light, this 50 nanoseconds would be enough to fly 15 meters. And that means long. Again, we have some uh, technical challenges here. So right now, this target uh, will have six kilowatt of heat and it's slightly bigger. So it's not uh, uh, that big of a problem. Also, since we have a uh, smaller beam of photons compared to beam of electrons, we need to have only 10 tons of shielding instead of 100 tons of shielding. And after that, we can produce a very nice beam of anti cairns and our, our, these anti kaons contain st strange quark. So that's the main reason why we have these uh, several iterations. We wanted to have particles which carry strange quarks. After we take anti kaons, we can make a scattering on, uh, for example, liquid hydrogen target and produce hyperons like lambda in addition to this, uh, to, to the element. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. To study interaction of hyperons, we need to scatter them once again to something on something else. And uh, the, like, for example, a scattering of hyperon uh, called lambda on proton within the same target. Because the half-life of lambda is even smaller than half-life of k. Uh, 
if you multiply it by speed of light, it's about seven centimeters, and that's the longest lived hyperon, which we know. And all other hyperons live even shorter, like four and a half centimeters or four or five centimeters, or even less. So we cannot translate, trans, uh, move this particle away from the target, they will just decay. So that's why we produce them in the same cryogenic target and uh, look up how they scatter on another particles. That happens fairly rarely, like one in uh, 10, 50,000 events. But uh, after several of these iterations and several days of measurement, we, we plan to measure it for uh, two years, roughly, we will accumulate enough statistics and can extract how hyperons interact with uh, normal matter and how hyperons interact with each other, which will help us to understand why neutron stars exist with uh, two solar masses and uh, not one point half or even half a solar mass maximum neutron star mass. Also, it will help us to understand what happened at the very early stages of universe right after the Big Bang and understand why universe cooled that fast and not slow and not faster. Uh, that is also a very interesting topic uh, to study. Here is the, the full picture of the experiment which we want to do. So we start with electron, a compact photon source, given photons produce cairns, and then measurement, the experiment by itself called GLUEX uh, is a very nice detector as the main uh, reason for this detector to be built was a study of uh, exotic, uh, other exotic particles, uh, uh, but uh, we will use it uh, to measure hyperons and uh, hyperon interaction. This this I come to a conclusion. So we have a lot of uh, new techniques. And neither of these techniques are simple. So we have gravitational wave observatory, which takes kilometers and which are extremely precise. We have new astronomical measurements from uh, detectors like NICER or new uh, telescopes. We have new accelerator techniques and all of them are fairly complicated, but they can produce very precise and very interesting results. And you can join it and also make your own discovery in the near future. So there are a lot of space uh, and plenty of topics to be explored to, uh, to make your own discovery. And we hope to learn a lot more about neutron stars and uh, early universe based on these uh, experiments. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope it was clear. So uh, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Mikhail, um, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we have a first question, which is, what is a Bose condensate? Um, well, you remember we discussed that if you have fermions, which are spin one half particle, like half integer frequency of rotation, they cannot place in one place. But if we have bosons, like photons or particle with their integer spin, they want to be in one place. And if you put them together, cool down to fairly low temperature, they just jump at one location and uh, form a very interesting uh, state, which called both Einstein condensate. It's a uh, kind of uh, false uh, type of matter compared to solid gases, liquids. So if you have bosons, they can do this kind of thing. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have another question. Where will KLF be? Uh, how much will it cost? Who's paying for it? And who will be the researchers? <laughs> so uh, the KLF will be located in our United States, in our Virginia. And uh, the, the laboratory called Jefferson Lab, Thomas Jefferson National Laboratory. So the nice thing about KLF is that we reutilize existing accelerator, existing line, and existing detector. So all we need to build is this compact photon source 
and uh, new beryllium target. Uh, that's where these things are pretty cheap, and you would not believe me that the main expenses is actually coming from the cost of tungsten. And the main issue is coming that the main producer is, of tungsten is China, and right now states and China have some issues, so there is no easy way to get cheap tungsten from China and bring it to US. So all in all, investments uh, will be mild, or uh, in uh, like uh, a few million of, uh, of dollars. Take into account that running of accelerator like uh, Jefferson Lab cost you uh, $20,000 an hour. So in this sense, uh, just uh, uh, something like uh, five, 10, 10, 10 million dollars, that is not a big investment. So recent upgrade of Jefferson Lab cost the uh, US government about uh, uh, 300 millions. Now who will pay? So largely it will be paid by uh, US government, but also by other uh, universities who are involved. So for example, uh, different universities who plan to make a measurement, you'll build uh, different equipment. For example, York supposed to build flux monitor uh, to monitor how many chaos do we produce uh, in our measurements. Some other near universities will be will build another part, so it's spread over all people who want to perform measurements there. And uh, all in all, there the prices for each and single university or country is uh, not that, that large. Again, the main the main price is coming from tungsten. So if you have hundred tons of tungsten and you can borrow it to me, I will be <laughs> I will really appreciate it. Okay, the final part of that question was who will be the researchers? So is that from the different universities that you were talking it's, uh, about? It's different universities uh, <laughs> from uh, all around the globe. So there are a lot of people from states. In uh, in UK, there are several universities who will make uh, studies there. Germany, France, Italy, Japan, China. So a lot, a, a lot of countries and a lot of universities. Great. Um, okay, another question. How do you tell if a neutron star has only one bright spot or something like a string of bright spots if you're calculating its rotation speed? That is an interesting question, but... <clears throat> so you say, let's say if we have two spots, uh, well, we, we, we know the rotation. No, we, we, we know the rotation speed not uh, not by counting these uh, uh, spots. That's we know from 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 another observations also. So, uh, we usually have a lot of bright stuff from let's say north and south poles, and by rotation we, we, we can find out what is their uh, rotation velocity of neutron stars. So the velocity of rotation we know before we make a measurement of uh, bright spots. But uh, now I, I, well, even if you have several bright spots, it doesn't happen Sarah, all the time. So what can make us a trouble if you have always two bright spots appear at the same time. That can make our life difficult, but since uh, the other side of neutron star does not know what, uh, what happens on the other side, uh, that shouldn't be a big problem. So if you look up for several of uh, such bright spots uh, in different days, uh, then all of these kind of events uh, should be averaged out. Okay. Uh, should the degeneracy pressure of hyperon be higher than neutron? Um, because this um, student said they expected a compact object made of hyperon to be more massive than a neutron star. Uh, yes, you, you may expect it to be more massive. Unfortunately, it will be also smaller. So you cannot make... So the density of matter with hyperons is larger compared to matter with just protons and neutrons. So the object with hyperons is more dense, but then if you make it with uh, two solar masses, the radius of this object become very small and it just collapses into a neutron star. So anything above 1.4 solar mass, 
these high drones will create so much pressure in their density inside that it will just collapse into a black hole. And uh, that, that, that's the problem. Okay, and so what creates the bright spots on a neutron star? Uh, well, there are several possibilities. So the simplest one, if you have some gas around, let's say from a neighboring companion, and that fall down onto a neutron star, you have a high gravitational pressure, then this gas start uh, to perform nuclear uh, fusion, and that gives you light. So you just borrow some matter from a neighboring star and start to burn it on the surface of neutron star. That gives you light. Okay. So assuming that uh, KLF, you know, we, we get the, the tungsten that we'd like from China, <laughs> um, when would you expect to start getting some results from it? Uh, we plan to build this, uh, all the equipment we need by the end of 25. In 26, start to make first test, and then immediately after to make measurements. So 26, 27, maybe first part of 28, we should already have data, and the results should come immediately. Okay, so for any students listening, that's prime time for you to have yeah. uh, embarked on a <laughs> degree and, and, and be involved in, in the field. Um, and so what are you kind of expecting to see from the first results? Uh, well, a very first results would, would probably wouldn't be linked to hyper-nuclear interaction because that is a fairly difficult topic. However, we expect to produce a lot of other strange particles uh, because we have a very nice cairn beam and we expect to discover about 50 to 60 new particles. And that is a lot simpler compared to looking for hyper-nuclear interactions so these kind of things will come in like, I don't know, two, three months after you start uh, the measurement. And these are probably would be the first results. Uh, with hyper and stuff, uh, we would need like a couple of years to figure out all of the systematical uncertainties. So you say 50 to 60 new types of particle. Is that new? New particles, yeah. And is that because they're heavier than other ones? Produce, uh, what is yeah. it about this detector that can detect these that um, no other detector would have done before? So most of accelerators use uh, things like uh, photons, electrons, or protons to produce other particles. And uh, all of these photons, electrons, or protons doesn't contain strange quarks. Now, can beam have strange quarks. That's why it is a lot easier for us to produce strange particles with cairn beam compared to any other experiments. And uh, that is why so we knew a lot of uh, particles with light quarks. Uh, we meanwhile know quite a lot of particles with charm quarks, but the particles with strange quarks, uh, we didn't uh, have that many. And uh, since we will have new cairn beam, we plan to discover a lot of them and we know roughly what should be their masses, what should be their properties. We learned a lot from our history with light quark measurements. So now we're just waiting for to switch on accelerate and start get new particles. That's very exciting. And, and how do you go about naming these new particles? Uh, that's very unfortunate actually for students because uh, there is a predefined way how to name particles depends on their properties. So okay. even if you discover a new particle, it has already a name long ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So um, another student has asked, so you say on the slide, the KLF, it described the detector as producing K-on antiparticles rather than simply K-on particles. Is there any reason for this or are anti-K-ons merely easier to produce? Uh, that's a very good question. So actually you can produce both cans and both anti cans Now for historical reasons, a particle which carries strange quark called anti cairn and a particle which carries anti-strange quark called cairn. 
Since we want to produce hyperons particle with strange quark, we, we only interested in anti kms and not in kms. That is like uh, a little bit confusing, but that's history. The same is like electron charge or minus not plus, these kind of things. So anti kms are good stuff with strange quarks inside. Okay, and this is a question that's come up for some other types of physics in the past. How how does the um, how will the system go about storing all the different data that's being produced? Does it reject um, things that it doesn't think as showing strange particles and delete that data, or is it all stored somewhere? Well, usually it is a problem for 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 for, for, for many of accelerators. Let's say in normal accelerators, you produce or let's say million events per second. Out of these million events, you can store in electronically store, let's say 10,000 events at most. And out of these 10,000, most of these events are rubbish. So you're interested in maybe one or two and you threw away events which you are not interested at very early stage. Since we have very low and fairly low intensity of can beam, it is, like uh, 10,000 particles per second instead of many millions. We can store all events without rejecting uh, some unwanted, which we think unwanted. So maybe we want, we just wrong uh, about our wishes. So we can store all of events and we, uh, it, it, there will be enough storage. So there is no problem with that due to fairly low intensity of KMD. Okay. Uh, one student is asking, how many more dimensions are you adding to the standard model? Well, it is uh, uh, no extra dimension, so it's well within standard model. Uh, the main problem with standard model, so we know the standard model, but some things we cannot calculate. So we know that we have three quarks, uh, for example, made a, a proton, but we cannot really calculate from basic principles, how this proton is formed out of these uh, three quarks. Uh, that's just uh, too complicated for us from a mathematical point of view. Right now, we start to calculate it using numerical methods. They are also very advanced, but we are not at the final position where we can say, okay, that's the equation from standard model. Now we can calculate property of each particle or interaction between each particle. Okay, uh, I've got another question here. Are a pulsar's poles where the beams of electromagnetic radiation emerge, are they traditional north and south, like a bar magnet, or is it more complex? Yeah, they're, they're, they're traditionally north south, yeah. Okay, and can you think of any potential applications then? Um, for this work in the future, depending on, on what, um, what is detected by KLF? Uh, actually, yes, sir. well, maybe, so we don't know. But for example, one of the reasons why we are interested in uh, these hyperon interactions, people predict that actually you can form something like nuggets out of this strange matter, and these nuggets can be uh, dark matter. We don't know if it is true or not, but if it is true, there is somewhere in space flying a lot of nuggets made out of strange quarks, which we can take, catch it, and use uh, for many other reasons, like a good source of energy or something else to produce new materials. Uh, right now, we don't know if they can be formed or if it can be not be formed. And that depends on how strong uh, hyperons interact between each other, what is the equation of state for hyperonic matter. But that is uh, one of the possibilities proposed long ago, and we still don't know the answer. Okay, so are you saying that that could be produced at KLF, or do you well, the, 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 the KLF? Strange, strange matter we cannot produce at KLF. So for this, you need a lot of strange quarks just in one place, and we have uh, like 10 to 10,000 cams per second, so that, that's nothing. You need millions of them in a fraction of a second. 
But uh, what we can do, we can reconstruct what is the interaction between different strange particles. And that should help us to understand, can we form these blobs of uh, strange matter, or if it is uh, completely ruled out? Okay, so we've got a question that if these nuggets of strange matter are potentially responsible for dark matter, would they all have been produced early in the universe, near the time of the Big Bang, or gradually across the history of the universe? Yes, they're supposed to be produced very early after Big Bang. So I mentioned maybe very briefly, so in very early times, we had quark soup. And at the time, then these quark soup become particles, we have equal amount of up, down, and strange quark. So each fjord quark was strange. And that's why these strange quarks could combine to form these kind of nuggets together with these other quarks. So we had very high pressure at that time, and we had very large amount of strange quarks. That's why it was fairly simple for them to combine in uh, some uh, small objects. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Miguel, for answering so many <laughs> questions from the students. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for coming along this evening. Uh, just a reminder to all um, viewers that the recording of this event will be available on the Department of Physics YouTube channel and a link will be sent to all ticket holders. And if you'd like to find out more about this and other research taking place here in the physics department, a link to our online course with FutureLearn uh, has been shared in the chat. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening, and I hope you have a wonderful evening.